Uh, first off, my name is Chris Cabot, uh, VP of Technology Research and Development for uh, Affordable Care. A um, little bit about myself. You know, there's my dad and my, my younger brothers. Actually, the youngest brother right there turned 24 today. So this was taken quite a while ago. But I grew up in a laboratory. Um, my dad's an orthodontist. So not removable focused, obviously. But I, I, my first, I guess, exposure to the dental industry was growing up in an orthodontic lab. And in my family, once you turn 13, once you become a teenager, you got to get a job. So what better than to go actually work at your own family's lab and get paid 25 bucks an hour as like a 13-year-old kid. I was like, I can't beat this. Thanks, Dad. That's how I got my allowance. I had to work for it, right? So I learned at a, at a young age how much fun it was to you know, carve my fingernails off on a model trimmer or put some wire through my arm. Um, actually, one time, got had a nice little Bunsen burner accident. I have a nice big scar here still from that. So I took my lumps. I took my lumps, but I learned that digital would probably be a little bit nicer of a way to go moving forward. Uh, I went to university to become a biomedical engineer. And while I was in school, uh, I worked a lot on really different types of CAD CAM software. So I you know, grew up with uh, you know, some of the old predicate technologies like SolidWorks and Blender and Geomagic. And some of these softwares that I was fortunate enough that my university was able to have for us kids to play around with. And I, I really started getting excited about really digital designing and really nothing to do with dentistry. Uh, however, I was planning to, to try and follow in my dad's footsteps. I wanted to go to dental school. I wanted to take over the orthodontic practice. He had a pretty nice quality of life. I was like, that looks good. I, I'll just follow in his steps. But you know, when I, when I graduated from college uh, in, in 2010, I graduated in 2009, uh, while I was still in university, I ran into a dental technician and a dentist who had really interesting concept of creating 3D printed surgical guides for dental implant surgery, but they had no idea how to do any of the CAD CAM work. So luckily the dentist was friends with my dad. So he, my dad's like, hey, do you wanna you know, talk to these guys, see if there's anything you can do to help them out? So we started working on developing the first ever uh, 3D printed surgical system for stackable surgical guides. Uh, we wrote that IP uh, in the middle, what, 2008, 2009 area, uh, when I came on, really helped them try to commercialize that product. So after graduating college in 2010, I said to dad, I'm going to take a year off. I'm going to work on this project. It's pretty cool. We've got some interesting IP that's creating a lot of buzz. And he's like, you're not taking a year off. You got to go right to school. So actually, dad and I got a big fight. I was like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to see what happens. And uh, I, I still haven't gone to dental school yet today. So uh, look, dental technology uh, there's a path forward to really providing better treatments to your patients. And the first time that I really started doing these stackable surgical guides, um, th the best use case was obviously for these all on four type of cases. And one of our local prosthodontists had a patient who had terrible terminal dentition and they needed to have all their teeth out. Obviously we put together a good stackable workflow for them. And it was the first time I ever got to see the reveal, right? Where, you know, shucked all their teeth, placed a couple implants, delivered the final restoration, same day. And when you put that mirror in front of them, and we got to see the look on their face of how this literally changed their life, tears start coming, I was like totally hooked. So I said, Dad, there's no chance I'm going back to dental school. This is what I want to do. And I'm going to make a better, bigger impact than I would have if I just became an orthodontist working in your office. So uh, after working with them for about five years, I decided that this is just the beginning of how 3D printing and digital technology is going to impact the dental industry, not just for surgical guides, but how do we create long-term digital products that we can fabricate to reduce the cost of care, make it more affordable so more people can have that life-changing experience that really got me addicted to digital dentistry in the first place. So I left my company back in 2015 and went to go work at uh, Envision Tech at the time. Uh, when I joined Envision Tech, uh, they were really pretty much just printing wax and models. And I was very much interested in, do, in skipping the prototyping process. I wanted to go direct to the patient. How can we finally print applications that can withstand you know, the harsh environment of the oral cavity for the long term? So for a number of years, spent really all of my energy trying to help Envision Tech come out with you know, innovative solutions that were direct to the patient, night guards surgical guides, dentures, uh, indirect bonding trays. We had a lot of industry firsts while we were there for that short period of time from about 2015 to 2018, and uh, we had a lot of fun doing it. Um, but I also wanted to 
go to the user side of the business. So uh, that's why I'm here at Affordable Care. How can we use this technology to deliver better quality treatment to our patients? And Affordable, their mantra of, of providing more affordable care to as many patients as possible matched up exactly with how I feel uh, about digital dentistry and the promise that it has uh, to deliver to the patient. So if you don't know about us at Affordable Care, uh, one of the largest DSOs uh, in the US today, uh, we have the number one market share in terms of providing removable prosthetics to the nation. We have over 400 practices. We have you know, about six to 700 doctors on staff. We have about 1,000 dental technicians that we employ. Uh, all of our dental technicians outside of our corporate team are actually local. They're in the practice. Affordable is affordable because we have technicians, clinicians underneath the same roof communicating together to provide the best possible treatment they can for their patients. So last year we did about 1.1 million dentures total is what we had fabricated. Uh, didn't deliver that many, but we fabricated about 1.1 million dentures last year. We did a very small fraction of those digital. And obviously as we move forward here, uh, digital is just gonna allow us to do more of these cases. And that's really what we're gonna talk about today is what is coming out that allows us to be more comfortable to put our, our brand behind these digital materials. Uh, because look, up to this point, we've had a lot of lackluster materials that have come to the marketplace. I'll admit, when, when I was at Envision Tech in 2017, when we came out with the first ever FDA cleared 3D printed denture base uh, through a company called Nextent was the material provider. We were the machine provider. It was awful. Uh, the color was terrible. It looked like a translucent orange. Uh, and the only way to get some type of material consistency was you had to sit there and shake it like a shake weight for an hour before you could actually print the material. And still we weren't getting consistent and reliable results. So it's really not until now do we have materials that really will allow us to digitize the entire tier of denture offering, not just the premium tier or the economy tier, but the entire tier of denture economically, and of course, providing good mechanical and material properties. So why? Why are we looking to go digital? If you look at the traditional digital denture or the traditional denture workflow, it's a typical five to seven appointment process. Uh, those of us that have done dentures by hand in the past, it's a messy process. Uh, wax, Bunsen burners, let's get away from all of that as we move forward into the digital age. Digital promises really a, a much shorter treatment plan. It provides a much quicker uh, delivery of the prosthetic to the patient. And at the end of the day, it should account for less adjustments, less relines, less remakes. So if we're able to deliver the same type of treatment in two, three, sometimes even one appointment, we're gonna be able to provide a better quality of care and a better patient experience. So digital not just provides efficiencies though, it, it also provides better fitting dentures. So we'll talk a lot about the accuracy of different digital dentures today. We'll talk about some of the aesthetics that come with the different denture materials that are in the market. We'll talk a little bit about the differences between some of the subtractive materials that we can mill and some of the additive materials that we can print because they're absolutely different ways of producing and definitely have pros and cons to both. So let's talk first about the printed materials. So digitally printed devices for removal prosthetics today, specifically for full arch dentures, there's really two things that we're printing, right? We're printing usually these monolithic or monoblock trions. Uh, Avident made this product famous. They called it their biofunctional trion or BTI. There's many different terms for this type of, uh, of trion denture. Usually the materials that are out here for trions in the marketplace are not shade specific. So a lot of the, the companies that are out there providing try-in materials today, some are actually like the same color as like a tan model material because their goal isn't to try and replicate shade. Their goal is to have a try-in material that provides two main things. What's the fit? What's the shape and size and position of the teeth? That was the main goal for the original biofunctional try-ins. I'm far more interested in finding try-ins that are true to shade because now I can actually show the patient exactly what their teeth are gonna look like when they do get that beautiful final denture. So currently we've got trying material, then we've got of course final or definitive denture material. There's a big difference in the qualifications in terms of regulatory, which is something we have to give Keystone a lot of credit for is their prowess on the regulatory side of the business, making sure that we're providing safe, validated materials that are going into our patient's mouths. For a try and denture, it is technically a class one device, which means this is minimal contact in the oral cavity. This is not meant to be 
a material that is supposed to be in the mouth for the long, long term, right? This is a try-in application. Most companies go out and get their FDA clearance as a class one device. However, for definitive devices, we need more robust clearances. So class two device would be a final denture. So both the denture base and the denture tooth would need to have their individual clearances as well as a system, right? We need to validate the bond strength if we're printing a denture base to a denture tooth and we are bonding those two products together. We know exactly how strong that bond strength is so that we can make sure we're providing good, safe products that are not gonna have teeth popping off left and right. So the two main products that we're printing right now, again, class one device in the try and a class two device in the final. People say FDA approved. I instantly lose credibility for them if they're talking about a class one or class two device. We hold FDA approvals for class three devices. These are implantable devices like implants, um, you know, cranial implants, dental implants. These are class three devices. There's more risk, which is why they go through an approval process. So if anybody says, my denture just got FDA approved, they don't know what they're talking about. They got FDA cleared. Big difference between the two. I know that sounds monotonous, but I don't know. Maybe it's just a pet peeve of mine. But there's a big difference when you look at the regulatory pathways between a, well, a class one, a class two, and a class three device. So if you feel like poking holes in a lecture or if you see him talking, that's one you can get them on because people make that mistake all the time. So again, what do we use that biofunctional try-in for today? Again, we use it to verify tooth position. Now we can have aesthetic materials that we can confirm shade selection. We can communicate adjustments, of course, back and forth with the patient. But this is a little bit of a, uh, a differentiator compared to what we've done in the past. The try-ins before, we were usually using what? A hard acrylic base plate, wax, setting denture teeth. So technicians had the ability to manipulate these dentures on the fly to try and get to that final setup before they, of course, go ahead and process the denture. We don't have that luxury today with the current digital denture workflows without really doing some hacking. Right now, it's all one material. Now, you can dress these up and make them look really nice so that you have, let's say, the pink gingival flange. Uh, you can, of course, stain and glaze the teeth. You can make these try-in dentures look beautiful, and we'll, I'll show you guys a ton of cases where we've made try-ins look ridiculously beautiful, but it's expensive. And we'll talk about some of the negatives of, of doing a lot of characterization to these products and what that does in the mouth over time as well. Once we get aesthetic enough, I do believe that these try-ins will have the ability, as long as they are a class two printable material, like the teeth are today, these could be dentures that our patients take home. We do see that sometimes being asked from the doctors where you know, our patients don't just wanna try and, and get it set there in the clinic. They actually wanna go home and show their friends, their family, and get buy-in from their cohort about what this denture looks like and if they wanna make any adjustments and communicate those to the laboratory before they move forward with the final denture. So no longer are we just looking at the try-in as really a simple piece of our workflow. It's a vital piece of our workflow. And I know a lot of people think that virtual reality, augmented reality is gonna make the try-in moot in the future, but there is nothing that's gonna replace getting that denture fitted onto the patient where we can validate fit and suction. So back in my uh, Envision Tech days, when we first came out with our, our first try-in material, uh, went down to Dr. Valerie Cooper's practice in, uh, uh, in Dayton, Ohio, and really started seeing how we could start implementing digital dentures. This was early stages. First time that we had an FDA cleared material. Valerie likes to offer free pro bono work to her patients during what's called American Prosthodontic Week. So um, myself, Doug sitting in the back, we took a printer down there and we decided to, to pitch in for that week. Now Valerie in the past has done this for every American Prosthodontic Week. The first time she did it, she was able to do two dentures that week. Well, then she started doing milled dentures. So she was able to deliver five dentures the week of American Prosthodontic Week. We came down and in one week, we were able to do close to 25 dentures, uh, to provide completely pro bono, uh, free to the patient, um, to provide them really as she described, which uh, this is a term I still use today, dentures are a life-saving medical device. If you are completely a dentate and you don't have any way to really process a bolus the proper way, you're not gonna digest your food the right way. You're not gonna get the nutrients that you normally would, uh, you know, conventionally digesting material, creating good bolus. This is why there's such uh, differences between lingualized occlusion, occlusion and balanced occlusion. Every different doctor has their concept of the pros and cons between the two. I'm personally a lingualized fan because it is known to creating a better bolus. 
to create a better digestive pathway so that we get better nutrients from our food. Now, you can see she made those dentures look beautiful. Um, that's because she is married to an incredibly good dental technician. And when we went through and did this process, it took us actually about $80 in materials to get to that final aesthetic and about four hours of work. So uh, not technically scalable, but it started to provide us that sort of proof of concept of what this technology can do moving forward. And the reason that we did everything monolithic is because the denture base materials back in this time in 2017, 2018, were just horrific. They were incredibly translucent. They're incredibly brittle. So we decided to take a tooth material and make the gingiva pink, right? So this was the first time I started seeing the value of a truly aesthetic trion. Now, we only had one shade of tooth at that time to actually go through and create that trion with. And something that uh, really I wanted to talk to you guys all about today is really the new release of Keystone's new key print trion material. Those three shades you see right there are about 80% of the shades that are delivered today with removable prosthetics in the marketplace. So Keystone really is the first company to have a trine material that is shade specific, that hits the primary shades that we see today in the marketplace. And conventionally printed shades don't conform to the Vita Shade Guide. And you know what, I'm not gonna claim that these shades really conform to the Vita Shade Guide perfectly either because we aren't printing in variable layers. We are printing monolithic parts. You can get transition from incisal to apex. However, it all is because of the thicknesses of the part, not necessarily because of the material itself. So these are monochromatic materials. However, it's the first time that we have a trine that hits the three primary shades that are currently in the marketplace today. So the other thing is I care a lot about mechanical properties. I'm an engineer, so I'm always gonna nerd out and taking a look at some of these material qualifications. One, first thing I care about the most with the Tryon, did it pass cytotox? Obviously, they're not gonna be bringing these materials to market if they don't pass cytotoxicity, but making sure that we have a safe product that's free of residual monomer is very, very important to creating a good experience for the patient. We'll talk a little bit about post-processing and why that plays a big role in getting a desired outcome. The other thing is getting shade that's gonna be true from try, or sorry, from the second it comes off the printer to the time it actually goes through the curing. So a lot of these materials struggle to maintain shade as it goes through the curing process. Different curing boxes are really going to impact that shade. So that's why I always talk about following those instructions for use. Keystone has done all of the hard work for you guys. They validate pretty much every printer and system. So it's not just the printer, it's the curing box as well. All of that is available on their website. I urge you, if you're gonna bring on any of these materials into your laboratory or your clinic, that you follow those rules to a T to get an expected outcome. And it's many, many different printers that they have in the marketplace today. So, um, you know, Keystone doesn't have their own printer. They only create material. And as you see here, they've partnered up with pretty much all of the leading additive companies to be able to provide validated workflow solutions so that you guys as the user don't have to do the R&D on your own. That's what a lot of the, the predicate, I'd say digital material companies had done in the past, where they would come to market with the product and they would rely on you, the user, to come up really with the system. So we have to give Keystone a lot of credit for going through and actually doing the hard work, providing the blueprint for you as the user to follow so that you get a good expected result. Again, it's not just the printer, right? It's the entire ecosystem. So almost every curing box that's really popular today that's on the marketplace, Keystone has that as a database. So the QR code is up there in the top right corner. Definitely feel free to scan that. It'll take you right to their matrix that goes through all of their different post-processing workflows. And it's on their website. So how do we dress up the monoblock? I, I showed you that quick picture with Valerie. I'm gonna show you how we actually got to that final step. So John, Valerie's husband, is absolutely brilliant. You can see how beautiful that result is. However, to get to that result took a long time. But how do we go from a conventional trion to a highly aesthetic trion? We, want, we need material that is non-porous. So the predicate materials that have been in the marketplace before, like the next dent materials, incredibly porous. So after we would go through, we spent all of that time and money to make these dentures look beautiful. After that denture was in the mouth, pretty much within 90 days, all of that stain and glaze was gone because the material was incredibly porous. So again, going back to the mechanical properties, why they matter so much, and one of the reasons why the Keystone material is, is solid is that it is less porous than some of the conventional materials that have been uh, in the marketplace before it. So 
we're not gonna have as much of a problem with stain and glaze wearing off, but no matter what, we're gonna run into this issue specifically with 3D printed parts. 3D printed parts are known for being more porous than milled parts. That is just the nature of the beast, and that is also because of the technology that we're using today to print with. We're printing in layers, and when you print in layers, sometimes we introduce porosity into the mix. The other thing is if the patient has any hygiene problems, that's gonna wear off a hell of a lot faster than if they don't. So if the patient is a smoker, don't spend any time really trying to dress up printed parts because that stuff is gonna be wearing off incredibly quick. Again, this is a porosity problem. So newer generation materials are getting better at addressing this issue, but we're still not perfect. So yes, you can go through all of this time to make these beautiful, and there's John and his little one working at the desk. The workflow that John goes through to create his aesthetic try-in, again, this is a try-in they send home with the patient, remember, for you know, a, sometimes a 30, 60, 90 day period to get buy-in on the clinical outcome. He goes through a cutback process. Now you can do this cutback digitally now, where you can easily inside of a lot of the softwares go through, reduce the flange, keep the teeth true, and then you're going to of course lay your composite in that void. So I wanted to show this picture so you can sort of see what the shelf looks like in terms of the cutback that we're presenting. This is about a full millimeter cutback that they're going through when they're creating their aesthetic triants. Uh, for these cases, we use the, the Anextent material and the GC material. We've tried them both out in the past. Uh, both provide great results. Uh, both are great materials. I'm not gonna say one's better than the other. They both have a place in our marketplace today and are you know, supported by good companies behind them. So obviously going through this process is laborious <laughs> and you know, sort of blows the cost model out. However, you absolutely can create incredible results. So you know, John is a master dental technician and he's able to create results like this uh, at first, again, I was telling you, it took us about four hours. At the end of this, when he sort of perfected his workflow, he was able to start doing these in about 45 minutes because he wasn't, of course, extending the characterization all the way to the posterior. He was focusing on the aesthetic area because this was gonna be the buy-in for the patient. And that's the protocol that they seem to move forward with and have been quite successful with as well. So this is the type of result you can achieve if you spend a lot of time with, of course, composites and printed products but are they gonna last? That was the problem before. The new materials that are coming to market, like the Keystone Trine material, are getting us to a, a position where we can feel a little bit more confident if we are gonna spend time taking a Trine to make it look like this. So how do we judge or evaluate digital denture materials as things move forward? Obviously, we talked about aesthetics. So it's the main thing I wanted to convey to you about the Trines versus where we're moving forward with. Aesthetics with conventional denture materials, we'll talk a lot about. Um, because they were really lacking to where we are now. We'll talk a bit about fit and then fracture resistance. After doing a lot of surveys to clinicians, technicians, and patients, these were the three things that we found we were trying to really deliver a premium quality product with. And when we first came to the market with the, uh, you know, the first generation of printed denture materials, they were incredibly translucent. So. Uh, my friend Eric Kachuka, I, I call him my troll because I live in Detroit, he's in Windsor, he's under the bridge. Eric is one of the best denturists in the world, by far. Um, and Eric has always been kind enough to allow me to use some of his photography because he's incredible at documenting his work. So I'm using Eric's pictures here. As you see on the right, we have the printed denture. Again, the knock against the printed denture has been that the base has been too translucent, the teeth are too opaque. That simple. Also, we're not able to build fibrosity right now into our printed denture bases. Now, I'm a nerd, I've played around mixing like the GC flocking powders into the conventional printed denture base materials and you actually can get good disperse of, of fiber into your printed denture base, but it is necessarily impossible to try and control a homogeneous mixture of flocking powder into a denture base slurry. So right now, the only way we can achieve those types of premium premium aesthetics in a, in a digital denture base is through the milled denture bases. So milled denture bases today do have fibers embedded in them. That seems to be more preferred by the general market, both from the technician and the clinician perspective. Frankly, I don't think the patients know too much difference, but the clinicians and the technicians definitely prefer the aesthetics of a milled denture base over a printed denture base. And the same holds true for the digital denture tooth. Really, the predicate printed denture tooth materials were far too opaque, right? We need, 
We need the denture teeth to be more translucent. We need the denture base to be more opaque. And the first generation of, of the digital denture materials was the complete opposite. So milled denture teeth absolutely can transition from an A1 to an A35. I think we've all seen multi-layer tooth materials that are on the marketplace that are subtractive today, but they're not additive just yet. There are some companies that can print multi-shade. Uh, there's a company in Italy called DWS that can actually print from an A1 to an A35, but it's an expensive printer and it's not very reliable. So we're not there just yet in being able to provide transition into a printed tooth. Now, the best thing about digital dentures across the board is we have been easily able to prove through many, many iterations of data that the digital denture is going to fit better than the conventional denture. And I'll show you some research in the next few slides, but every denture that would go out of our central process facility, we would scan in, match it up against the STL file, and give ourselves sort of a quality control map of how accurate that denture was to the design file. Now, Something that we found really correlated, and I'll show you the research here shortly. You see down here, I'm using 100 micron tolerance. That is my internal standard. I want to at least be 90% or better at 100 micron analysis. That is a hard metric to hit, uh, especially for a, a, a maxilla. That's a lot of geometry to try and get really accurate. However, with the milled denture, what you're going to see is we were just slightly less accurate on average than we are in the printed denture. And the main reason for this by the way, this is the denture in its green state. So when both of these products come out of the machine, we're testing exactly the accuracy of the machine at that point. We also test as well to make sure that when we go through the post-curing process, what does our shrinkage factor look like as well? And the nice thing about the printed materials, the new age printed materials, is the shrinkage is minimal compared to what we saw in the past with the first generation of materials. Again, that's about porosity, absorption. The less absorption there's going to be, the less shrinkage there's going to be. We're going to end up with more accurate and stable dentures over time. So the reason the milled denture is less accurate out of the machine is one thing and one thing only, and that's tool path. Specifically in the intaglio anterior undercut zone. So I don't think this has a pointer on it. No, but right up there where you see that blue and the milled denture area, that's usually where the milled denture struggles the most to be accurate. So a lot of you that may have milled dentures in the past, I'm not sure if any of you have, but we do have to either overmill or undermill in specific areas of the denture and then mill those out or ream those out by hand. And that, of course, gets away from the value proposition of a digital denture. Printed dentures don't have that problem because we're not dealing with toolpath constraints anymore. We're building in a layer by layer in an additive manufacturing sense so that we don't have the errors or the inaccuracies that you can see in milling. Dr. Brian Goodacre, his dad, Dr. Charlie Goodacre, is, is legitimately the godfather of digital dentures. He was one of the founders of Avident, um, one of the leading thought leaders for digital dentistry, specifically in removable prosthetics. His son, Brian, is definitely following in his footsteps and has been providing some great research that's really proving our claim that a digital denture is more accurate than the conventional material. So again, my quality control standard on whether a denture is accurate enough to be in the mouth is that 200 micron number. And the reason that 200 micron number is our internal standard, again, that's the minimum we want to at least be at, is when you look at this data, if you look at the conventional pack and press workflow, we're easily introducing plenty of error into the denture base. So when you look at the CAD CAM denture, now, by the way, this is a milled denture in this study. They did not include printed dentures in this study. We do know that when we've added on to this study that the printed denture actually eclipsed the accuracy of the mill denture for that tool path that I described earlier. However, you could see that the most accurate way to replicate a denture base was the CAD CAM process in this study. We also want to take a look at tooth movement. So especially when we're bonding teeth into the base. So Dr. Goodacre did another study as well on how far the teeth are moving after we bond them into a denture base. You're going to see the most accurate and really the gold standard is going to be that monoblock. Again, this is why there's added value to printing that high aesthetic try-in is because you don't have to worry about those teeth being mobile on you. When we pair a denture base with a carded tooth, you can see what our industry has been used to. Again, that 200 micron number keeps coming up as being clinically relevant. So it's not just validating the accuracy of the denture base that determines whether it fits well on our patient. It's also understanding the occlusal scheme because if we're going to go through all of the, the process of creating a digital denture, and we're bonding teeth into it that may be moving over time, that's gonna skew our occlusion, that, that denture's not gonna last as long. 
especially for a DSO like ours that puts you know, generous warranties on our products. I don't want to be putting a product into the marketplace that may only last two or three years when we have a warranty or five to seven, right? So tooth movement is just as important as the intaglio fitting surface. What's also important when it comes to printing is orientation. This is why it's so important to go through and validate your instructions for use. So whenever you work with a new printing company, a new material, machine, and curing box, always make sure you're printing at the orientation that they have validated, because that's the only way you're gonna be able to try and replicate the results. Now, you can see here when I, this is a try right, obviously. When I put it with the facial flange being supported, so again, see how it's oriented inside the printer. After we print it and we go through the scanning process, you're gonna see that I have an absolutely pristine intaglio surface. We know this is gonna fit perfectly. We're probably gonna to get too good of a suction on this type of digital denture. But what it does is the trade-off is because I have those supports in the anterior, you're gonna see that my aesthetic zone is gonna be compromised. Because when we print with current DLP printers today, the support material is the same material as the is the final part, right? There's no differentiator between the purple and the gray that you see there. Those are printed out of the same materials. So in order for us to get this denture to the final state, we of course have to go through the process of debrewing, desprewing all of those supports. And of course, that's gonna impact my overall accuracy. It's gonna wash out sometimes that anatomy. So you could be sitting there spending hours trying to recontour in the anatomy that the printer replicated for you but was covered up by the supports. So. In, in the try indenture application, we've got two critical features, right? We've got our intaglio surface and we have our tooth surface. We need to validate both of those to be able to move on to the final denture. And if we print in an orientation like that, we may have a great fitting denture, but if the patient smiles in the mirror and we're not able to replicate that result, well then we're not being able to provide that level of service that the patient's expecting. Let's flip it around. In this case, we did the opposite. We printed supporting the intaglio surface. And if you look at the accuracy data of the intaglio surface, again, you're gonna see that it's not as pristine as when we oriented it with the facial surface. Okay, now, again, that 200 micron number is what I'm using as a validation here, and I'm still within tolerance when I look at the palate, but my tooth surface is pristine. So is there a clinical relevance in this denture fitting in the patient versus this denture fitting in the patient? Not really. They're really close. Like you're really not gonna notice too much of a difference in fit between this denture printed in this orientation and this denture printed in this orientation. We're talking about like a 5% accuracy change. It's not much. But I'm gonna save myself a ton of time and not having to reproduce that aesthetic area. And on top of that, I'm gonna be able to execute on this try and when I process it to final because I didn't have to actually do that manually. The computers all did this for me and the printer replicated it. So, instructions for use. Keystone has done a great job in going through and doing all of this hard work for you, so you don't have to go through all of the headache like I used to have to do in the past in, in failing. Uh, I always say to, to any operator of additive equipment and that they have a print failure, I don't care if you have a print failure, just learn from it. So, don't go through the same failures that I did. Just follow the instructions for use. Keystone did all of this hard work for you. It's there on the website. Um, and it's also there on every bottle of resin that you order from them. So when you receive that resin, you're gonna have a little pamphlet in there, and sometimes it's actually on the bottle itself that'll guide you through the right steps so you can get a known, repeatable, and predictable result. All right, so we talked about accuracy. We talked a little bit about aesthetics. Let's talk about fracture toughness because the existing digital denture materials, really the biggest stain on digital dentures right now is because of that first generation of printed denture materials was as brittle as glass. And when we look at really the qualifications for mechanical properties of a digital denture, there's a couple things we look for. There's flexural strength, that's something I prioritize, but what I really care about the most is fracture resistance. I do all of our testing in accordance to ISO 20795, which is the ISO standard for a denture-based polymer, a rigid denture-based polymer. And again, when you look at the flexural strength of the old really first generation printed materials that you're gonna see under the yellow line here on the left. Next dent, Dentka, Daytax, decent flexural strength, right? But you're gonna notice that their fracture resistance is nowhere close to that minimum standard for a, for a high impact denture. In order to be considered a high impact denture in ISO's eyes, if I'm gonna go on Affordable's website 
and say that we're providing a high impact denture for a specific tier of denture, I need to be able to prove that that denture can meet that minimum standard of at least being 900 joules per meter squared. Now, what does that even mean, 900 joules per meter squared? The, the ISO test for a rigid denture base, when we're looking at fracture resistance specifically, we print out these little bars, we put these bars into water at you know, a, a relatively high temperature for actually seven days. So first we test the specimens dry, and then we test a same subset of specimens wet. The number that you see published is only the number tested in its wet state. That is in accordance to the ISO standards. So after seven days, we'd pull that, that block out of the water, you put it on the Instron machine, you break it, that's the number you see on the right there. That is the number that definitely correlates more with a durable denture-based material in the oral cavity over time. It's a rigorous environment, and we really want to have high-impact materials if we're gonna be offering a true premium digital denture. So I care far more about fracture resistance than I do flexural strength. It correlates more with remake, and when we find that we can deliver a high-impact denture, we have far less breakages. With the original Dentka material, I'll show you on the next slide here, we had about a 20 to 25% remake rate over a six month period, mainly from patients having their denture drop into the sink, shattering like glass. So milled dentures are definitely stronger on average compared to a printed denture today. And mainly that's because uh, we just have a little bit more innovation and really not more innovation, we just have more experience creating millable materials, pack and press materials that are already pre-polymerized so that when we're cutting them, we're really just subtracting. So, uh, you know, one of the most aesthetic, high-end materials that's in the marketplace today from a millable standpoint is gonna be the key mill high impact uh, material. The, I think the Diamond D disc is what some of the marketing names are for it out there in the marketplace today. If you're looking for a mill denture-based material that's gonna hit both aesthetics and fracture resistance, it's one of the best in the market. So for us, yes, I think the denture-based materials are getting better now. We see that we have new materials that have hit the market that are at least hitting the fracture resistance numbers that we're looking for. Now, you're probably asking what the NC means next to Flexera. Um, we do all of our own internal tests. We were not able to corroborate the manufacturer's numbers when we put them through our testing. Um, however, I think the numbers that they are advertising on the website are in the dry state. So always ask that question when you look at those, me those mechanical sheets. When you're looking at those, those technical data sheets, make sure you ask the right questions on, did you follow the ISO standard? Did you follow an ASTM standard? What was your number in publishing that? For the denture application, it is ISO 20795. We need to conform to that standard to provide good, valuable feedback. So I, I suggest that you always ask those questions. I love playing with, with 3D printing sales guys when they come into our office and making sure they really know their stuff. So push them on that, ISO 20795. This was our experience with the, dent, uh, the Dentka denture when we first started using them. Um, one of our fun tests as well is we always do the 72 inch drop test and this was consistent. We saw this all the time and it didn't have to be 72 inches. Again, if you drop that into a porcelain sink, many times it was shattering just like that. And my problem with that type of fracture is it doesn't fracture like a normal piece of acrylic. It actually sort of shatters like glass. Um, my fear, would be putting this denture into patients at scale. I had this terrible nightmare one time of a patient getting in a car accident, hitting their mouth on the steering wheel and aspirating that. And we pulled Dentka from the shelves, actually shortly after we started having a, you know, a remake rate over 25%. Uh, really in the dental laboratory business, we want that remake rate to be 5% or less. So that's what we strive to shoot for. This material put, I think, sort of a black eye on, on really the entire dental space, or the, 3D printed denture space because it wasn't just us experiencing it, it was the whole market that started experiencing these problems over time. So we have to give them credit, they've reformulated, they do have a more robust material nowadays, but there's definitely been a black eye put on the whole industry because of this first generation of printed material. A lot of that was due to fibro or sorry, porosity. So again, that was the main reason for breakage. Uh, again, when I was talking about the, the key mill material, if we're looking for something with less porosity, the millable materials absolutely have less porosity than printed materials today. It's just, it's science. There's, there's no way we can argue that. As we move forward, I think that we're gonna overcome that with more isotropic printing processes, but we're not there just yet. So again, if you wanna be completely comfortable and in not introducing any porosity into your removable prosthetic, 
the milled denture is absolutely one of those modalities you can follow. Let's talk about what's inside these resins so we can understand where some of this porosity comes from. Really, the resins are made up of these three main components. The monomers and oligomers really hold up the majority of these materials. There's gonna be the photo initiator, which is really the catalyst, the brains of the material. And then there's gonna be the additives. These are the dyes, the fillers, things we add into the denture base material, to the denture tooth material that give it its color and also sometimes give it its additional strength. So these are the three main components inside of a resin. We need those three components. We need the printer, we need the clean, we need the curing box, all to work in concert to create known results because this is what happens when you don't conform to the instructions for use and follow a validated system. Back when, uh, in my old days at the printing OEM, we had a, a doctor that had a printer in his office. And unfortunately for him, his curing box went down. Well, he was just printing a simple flipper for a patient, as you can see there, and he got lazy. His curing box broke, so he decided that after cleaning the denture, he's just gonna let it sit by the windowsill for 24 hours before the patient showed up the next day to deliver that, that partial. And this is what happened. Very allergic event. Now, I'm someone that's got all sorts of allergies, but you could be, you know, have the best immune system in the world. You're gonna have the same type of event here when you have a cytotoxic event. It is, uh, it is an allergy, it is almost poisoning you. So this is why it is so important to make sure that you follow those instructions for use. The cleaning and the curing are just as important as the printing itself in terms of creating a safe product that you deliver to your patients. Don't skimp on the workflow and you'll have a good result, unlike what you saw here. Also, if we follow the workflow to a T, you're gonna end up with your desired mechanical properties as well. So this is why all of these companies are so rigorous in their testing and creating that instructions for use because when they go to the FDA, that is what they submit. Now, a couple of key terms about the FDA. Um, the FDA really didn't start providing guidance on 3D printing and, and for really healthcare applications until 2018. And for the first time, did they start actually providing guidance on or asking for commentary on point of care manufacturing was this year. So right now, technically, as a doctor, you can put a printer into your practice. You could print any type of material you want, bond it all together, deliver it to your patient, and the FDA is never gonna say a thing to you because they can't legally. Because the FDA cannot police point of care manufacturing yet. However, now that they're taking commentary on it, just like they did in 2018, when they took commentary from us in the 3D printing space on how they should regulate medical devices with additive, you're gonna see this change where doctors now are gonna be held liable if they're not following validated workflows and using validated materials and processes. So it's not here just yet, but know that that's coming. Is the FDA ever gonna be able to police that? Well, they're gonna have to spend a lot of money on people to be doing some, uh, some door knocking. But if you're out there advertising online, that's gonna be when they start come you know, trying to figure out what you're doing. So. Moral of the story, follow the rules. If you follow that instructions for use, you end up with a known result. Um, when we go through the post-processing steps as well, all post-curing uh, units are slightly different, but they're really all delivering on these four main features. Wavelength, time, temperature, and brightness, or luminous flux. Those four things need to work in concert to get us to our known final state. So I could do a whole lecture just on these four things and how they impact the final state of a product, but no, this is why you follow the instructions for use, is they calibrate all of these to work in concert to get you to those final mechanical properties and to make sure that denture is safe when it goes into your patient's mouth. Shade has been something that we've been struggling with with digital materials really ever since the, the conception of digital dentures. And we're now starting to see aesthetic shades that are coming to market that allow us to address the entire population. It seems like we forget that over here in the US, the European companies never come out with ethnic shades for our gingiva. They just don't do it. So now finally there's been enough emphasis put on this that the OEMs are starting to come out with more aesthetic and ethnic shades so that every patient can be a candidate for this type of digital denture. We haven't seen that until recently. So what are the main digital denture workflows that we follow? There's really four perfect use cases for a digital denture one that I'll never use, but three that are very, very consistently predicted and repeatable. First is the immediate denture. It's by far the best workflow for a digital denture. Uh, there is the conventional denture workflow where we're still following a digital process, but we're using digital products to create that digital wax rim. 
not ideal. The referenced entry workflow uh, is probably 90% of the digital cases that you'll see the market doing today, is following that referenced entry workflow. We'll talk a little bit about that as well. And then the copy denture workflow, which is truly an existing denture that you are scanning and you have no ability to change anything about that denture before you produce it. The copy denture is a myth. If you're trying to do a new denture for a patient that has come in and that denture has been in the mouth for any more than 90 days, the copy denture doesn't really provide you with what we're trying to achieve in terms of recreating a digital prosthetic. For instance, if a patient shows up with a denture and that denture is, let's say, 30 years old, and you try to put that through a copy denture workflow, you're gonna see no transition of tooth to base, right? That, that's usually what happens. We see that wear in the posterior, that blending of the line of the gingival contour to the tooth. The software can't differentiate that, and you're just reproducing bad product. So the copy denture really is ideal for a brand, a brand new manufactured denture. So if you wanna start getting innovative with like subscriptions, we see others that are doing this right now, where you print out a denture, your final denture that you've gone through a reference denture workflow on, then maybe do a quick scan of that and send it up to the cloud because maybe the patient loses their denture, right? Maybe you provide a warranty or subscription service, insurance service, and all you gotta do now is just press print again because you have those two data files up in the cloud that you can tap into. So that's really the best use case for a copy denture in my opinion. But first thing we gotta do is we gotta scan these dentures before we put them into any of these workflows. So there's two real main types of, of technologies that we're using to scan these dentures today. Obviously some are using intraoral scanners um, and most are using conventional box scanners today. Now, the reason I put the intraoral scanner scanning the edentulous, specific, uh, the edentulous ridge specifically is because this is very new to the marketplace and there is a lot of controversy around uh, directly scanning the edentulous ridge. Now in the maxilla and the research that we have conducted, you can get to about you know, a 95% plus rate in creating a good prosthetic off of a scanned edentulous maxilla. That fits within our remake model. However, the lower is a fool's errand right now. Um, the software has really struggled to stitch the data together to give you a good accurate representation of that soft tissue, and we still don't have any way to account for soft tissue displacement. So specifically in the mandible, that is far much more of an issue than it is in the maxilla. So the best use case for iOS today for a digital denture still is take a conventional impression or use that reference denture, do a quick wash impression, then scan it in with your iOS. So you're not actually scanning the edentulous ridge directly, you're scanning in the denture. Again, whether it has a wash or not, whatever you're, you're trying to achieve, use it handheld. It's more predictable and repeatable today than it is scanning the edentulous ridge directly. However, as we move forward and the software gets better, we will be able to follow this workflow, but how many times does a patient show up with no denture, totally gummy? There's not a ton of patients that do that in, in the marketplace today. However, most of those patients that are in that position are coming to our clinic. So we do have to address that uh, and make sure we have a good workflow for those patients that do show up completely edentate. So let's talk about the immediate denture. So I'm, I'm using Eric's pictures again because I feel like he documents this perfectly and this is such a wild case that's uh, always fun to show. Again, the best use case for a digital denture today is for the digital immediate. All it takes to, to be able to provide a digital immediate denture and put it through an accurate design is take a record of the patient's existing dentition, how bad it may be, doesn't matter. We just need a record of that existing dentition. Inside the software, we're gonna strip the teeth, right? We're gonna go through a conventional immediate setup process, but in the digital realm. Now, the one qualifier for a good immediate denture material is we need material that can be manipulated chair side, right? So the Keystone cells, uh, the Bosworth light aligner material, um, you know, these types of pickup materials and reline materials, we need to bond with the denture, obviously, because we're always gonna be manipulating that surface surgically. We can't predetermine exactly what that surface is gonna, is gonna look like. The predicate 3D printed denture materials were not able to bond with a lot of the liners that were out there. So that's why it's also important to choose good denture-based materials that have known bondability and compatibility to the existing materials that are on the market for reline. Again, copy denture, direct duplicate. If there's any inaccuracies or if there's anything you don't like in that copy denture, if you scan that denture in, the software right now today is only able to take it and reproduce it in two files, well three. You get a monoblock file, you get a denture-based file and a denture tooth file. You print them, you bond them together, but you're only getting what you scanned in. You have no ability to design 
and manipulate that to really get to the patient's true expectation of what that new denture should look like. We have the conventional denture workflow, which you can still go through analog processes and create a, a wax up, scan that wax up in. I would say the trine is absolutely mandatory for this workflow. Going straight from wax rim to final in the digital denture space is, is a bit of a fool's errand. Now, here's where I wanted to spend really the only time that we have left is talking about this reference denture because this is uh, the best workflow for existing denture wearing patients. We can do a quick wash impression on this. We can put it through the design process. Frankly, as you get more used to the reference denture workflow, the try-in will become obsolete. We found when we first started doing digital dentures, we were actually doing three try-ins for every one final, and that's because we tried to marry our digital denture base to a carded tooth. We'll talk about that in the next couple of slides of why that's a fool's errand as well. But having a try-in as sort of an intermediary step is obviously just gonna allow you to confirm that your design was sound, but we certainly have seen a lot of folks that are using the reference denture workflow that go direct to final. So that's absolutely something that as you get more experienced in, in you know, clinically providing digital dentures, and if you've calibrated with a good lab that knows your idiosyncrasies and how you like to have your product set up, you absolutely can go direct to final. I do suggest, of course, having that interme intermediary step with the try-in as well. So this is what we're asking the designers to do when it comes to a reference denture workflow. We are asking the designers to take that existing reference denture scan, find a corresponding digital library that best fits that reference denture, and then they superimpose that digital library over the reference dentures you see here. The purple was the scanned indenture. The white geometries, of course, are the CAD CAM teeth from the corresponding digital library that was chosen. And that is how we go through the design process. Now, it is almost impossible, even if you are as good of a denture technician as, as Rodney and Keith are in the back and knowing every damn mold that's on the, on the market, being able to identify what's in that reference denture, and you may not have done that reference denture, but you're being asked as the designer to find the one digital library that corresponds best to it, is why we've had some problems delivering on a good final digital denture and why some are saying that digital dentures aren't able to deliver on expectation. That's because the software is set up this way, right? So we need to get to the point where we're blending the two workflows between copy denture and reference denture, where we can follow a copy denture workflow, use that existing foundation and account for wear, but none of the softwares provide that type of experience today. So today we are left with the tools at our disposal, which is really the reference denture workflow. So the designers, as they get more used to setting teeth in a digital fashion, they get more competent with this workflow. They understand the molds that they think work best for them, but they're still being asked to try and find which molds best correspond with what was in that existing reference denture. And the better you are with digital design, the more you're gonna get more competent at this workflow. But this is why there's such a learning curve when it comes to digital design specifically in the removable space. The reason carded teeth don't work well when it comes to this is because, let's go back. If I have to use a carded teeth, there's one thing that I don't have the ability to do with carded teeth, and that is I cannot manipulate or adjust that surface. Those are predetermined geometries. I can't touch them, right? I'm just printing a base, and I'd be putting the denture teeth into that base. So I have no ability to morph those denture teeth. This is why the really only true way forward for digital dentures is customizable tooth solutions. We need a base and we need, of course, a digitally manufactured tooth to be able to fit within the constraints of our patient's qualification. So this is why carded teeth struggle, not just because it's hard to try and sometimes fit a square peg into a round hole, but also because carded teeth are set up usually with long necks, right? I think any of us that are denture techs that have seen a carded tooth in the past, those eight, the apices on those carded teeth are quite long. So in the past, what used to happen this was an old denture before we started seeing some of the new digital denture teeth that would be on the right here, is we'd have to create a matrix that we would then use as a cutback jig to reduce those teeth on the intaglio side of the denture. So every single denture tooth technically penetrated the base. That created a weak point in the denture because we actually had holes throughout the whole denture, right? And we were just cutting that down. So that was a problem, right? There was a lot of labor involved in that process as well, and it introduced a lot of error and fracture potential into the denture. So we saw companies like Vita and Dent Supply come out with a digital carded tooth, and all of them are predicated off the same thing. We're gonna shorten that neck down so that we can fit these teeth into more 
bases without having the penetration because the penetration of the tooth through the base really was a weak point and caused a lot of problems. However, we still are left with having to be savants at understanding if our patients are going to qualify. So this was a metric I put together for our technicians back when we were doing uh, digital dentures with carded teeth because we wanted to know whether the patient's qualified or not. It was so frustrating doing digital dentures with carded teeth because we would have patients that would show up, the doctors would want to deliver a carded tooth solution with a digital denture, but they would scan the patient in, they would take them, get them to the reference denture stage, and then we'd find out during final denture design that we didn't actually have the vertical dimension we need to be able to provide a denture with a, with a carded denture tooth. So we had to pretty much go mold combination by mold combination to create a matrix so that the technicians knew, right, I've already lost you, and I lost my technicians too. So we need to get to the point where we are, of course, using customized tooth solutions because that's gonna allow us to deliver on the expectation of a high quality removable prosthetic. There's a lot of new training tools out there. Digital dentures are new for a lot of people. Um, I gotta give Carbon and 3Shape a lot of credit on really putting together an awesome new academy. I think it's, it's the best training collateral that I've seen in the marketplace today for digital dentures. It's a big leap forward. This just launched last month. So if any of you are, are Carbon and Keystone users uh, in, the, in the audience today, log into the Carbon Academy or reach out to your three shape reps. They can get you hooked up with this. They even offer free one-on-one -on -one training. The first hour is free. After that, you pay for it, where you actually get a direct line directly to the three shape designer to make sure that you're following the best practices in design. Because I think as we all know right now, the bottleneck in the digital denture is the design step, right? The average time to design a denture case is between 35 and 40 minutes. That's what the data is showing. So how can we get these technicians to that 35 to 40 minute point? We gotta do a lot of training to get them there. Because at first, when you first start doing a digital denture, I know when I first started doing a digital denture, and I'm pretty good with computers, it took me like an hour and a half to be confident with the setup that I was trying to produce. So I think we're getting to the point now where we actually have good education and training tools where the OEMs now understand what we're asking the technicians to do. And they're gonna sort of provide that white glove service to make you more competent in the digital design workflow. Now, finally, the last thing I wanted to talk about was, you know, Keystone has been coming out with some great materials and we've been talking about removable this whole time. Uh, the last slide I just wanted to, to bring up was talk about digital RPDs just quickly because RPDs are a huge chunk, of course, of our business and of course of uh, the removable business across the US. And right now to do digital RPDs, if we're gonna do Valplast, we essentially need to print Valplast on an, on an FDM printer, which is like a fish line printer. And those printers are very inaccurate and they're also very unreliable. So it's tough to do printed Valplast. There really isn't a good printed flexible solution that's in the marketplace today. I know laboratories uh, like mine in the past had done lots of the acetals, so like the Zerlux materials. Um, those are great ways of doing digital denture but it's not, that's not a flexible denture, obviously, when you're looking at the acetyl product. So we need some type of resin 3D printed um, flexible RPD. And Carbon and Keystone did announce that they are, are joining forces to develop this resin that we've been asking for for so long. So we have never had a printable type of Valplast material. Uh, I definitely urge you to go take, uh, you know, ask some of your, your reps at either company on what their status is on these materials yet, I'm not gonna speak for them. However, uh, this is something that we need to get digital removal to the next step. So with that, I just uh, wanted to thank Keystone, I wanna thank Zahn, I wanna thank Eric and John for giving me some of their photographs, and then of course to uh, Affordable Care for allowing me to be here today. And uh, thank you guys very much for your time today.